This morning's reading is from 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 through 16. Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. For to this you were called that you may obtain a blessing. For whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. We're continuing with our series on uh, follow me, what it means to be a disciple, to be a follower of Christ. We're trying to argue and show that scripture says they're all the same thing. Uh, And today's text is no different. So last week, uh, we tried to talk about how uh, Paul, uh, if I was trying to sum up very well what Paul, if Paul was trying to sum up what it means to be a disciple, it means being willing to, to understand what it means to dedicate yourself to this process, to be dedicated to this process. Well, uh, today what I want to do is do something with Peter. Now, Peter doesn't have somewhere saying, this is my summary of discipleship. So I, I think I went to a text that I think sums up very well Peter's view of what it means to be a disciple. Uh, and so the, the title is, uh, Follow Me, a uh, New Master and a New Hope. And like, what, what is that talking about? Uh, just a few weeks ago, uh, there was uh, an attempted coup in Bolivia. Uh, a general drove a vehicle into the, the uh, a military vehicle into the, the, the presidential mansion, and they got out. There was no gunfire. They just started yelling at each other. <laughs> the president started yelling at each other, and everyone got arrested. And we have members of our church who now live in Bolivia, and I called and said, is everything okay? And she was like, yeah, yeah, that's just Bolivia. She's like, I wish they had done something. It was just two guys yelling at each other. Now, that I mean, thinking about uh, in America, whenever we have our election, we like to talk about, uh, boast about how we have this amazing transition of power uh, in America where there's, there's not a lot of conflict whenever there's a big transition of power. And what I want to hopefully argue today, that when Peter is talking about what it means to be uh, a disciple, uh, I'm going to hopefully show you that what he's saying uh, is that what he wants to see in our hearts, Peter's definition of of a disciple, is that there is a transfer of power in your heart. But unlike what we like to boast in America that we've had peaceful ones, I'd like to argue that our transfer of power from one master to another usually doesn't go well. And I think that's what Peter is talking about today. But the context, I think, is amazing is Peter's going to combine the fact that being a disciple is absolutely tied to um, your witness and your, your, your evangelism at the same time. It's a great passage, and that's what we're going to look at today. So pray with me. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for this day. We can't do anything without you working in our hearts. So we ask that you would send the Spirit to work in our hearts, that we may be transformed by your word. We pray for all the kids in our church, that they too would be changed by the work of the Holy Spirit, that they would never know a moment without you as their Savior. We pray for anyone, Lord, um, else in our community, our greater community, who's wandered away from you. Uh, Lord, we ask that you would use, send the Spirit to draw them back to yourself. We pray all this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Uh, again, so the premise is that uh, what this passage is, Peter is not just saying uh, something about answering questions. I think what Peter is really arguing is There needs to be a transfer of power. You need to go from one master to another uh, in order to fulfill what it means to be a disciple, a follower of Christ. Uh, When I talk about a non-peaceful one, I think a very simple, silly one. But when I was uh, younger in elementary school, I remember I had the same basketball coach for a couple seasons, and then I had a new coach come in. 
and uh, he looked different, sounded different, coached differently. He was a new boss. And my response, like many of us may have, was to quit basketball. <laughs> I was like, I'd rather not play basketball than have this guy be my coach. And I wonder if when it comes to, uh, I remember being a disciple, being a Christian, being a all of those are synonymous. How many of us, uh, when it comes to him truly being Christ, being our master, uh, do we have the same response? And that I get it, I know who you are, I get the title, but I'm going to reject the idea that you are now my master. And so the way Peter is going to look at this, we're going to talk about witness and evangelism and talk about how those are different terms, very similar, but different terms and how uh, being a disciple um, is key to all of that and how Peter is pulling all those together. So first, let's talk about what it means to be a witness. A witness is someone, when we're talking about your witness, you're going to be living out the good news. Evangelism is speaking out the good news. Witness is living out the good news. Everyone got that? So the gospel is good news. So living out the gospel. Witness is about how you are living in this world. We'll talk about how you're speaking in a second, but how you're living in this world. In Matthew, Jesus talks about this. In the same way, let your light shine before others so they may see your good deeds and works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So your witness, I'm trying to argue here, is that, again, how you live out your life uh, proclaims that the gospel is a part of it. So we're going to dig in that a little bit, looking at the first part of 1 Peter 3.15. In your hearts, but in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy. Revere the Lord. Set him holy. Again, your, your goal is that your hearts uh, would be set apart, that the Lord God would be set apart, would be holy in your heart. We have a term for this. Uh, when Jesus taught us the Lord's Prayer, the very first thing he teaches us is to make your name hallowed, make your name holy. And so go back to that verse in 15. I think what it's saying, the same thing that Peter's saying, the same thing, that what he wants to see, that what we need to see is that in our hearts, we are setting aside God as hallowed. We are making his name holy. So how do we do that? Why is this so important? We'll talk about that just in a second. But how, how do we do this? How, what does that look like? Why, how, does that, how does that happen? Well, again, the concept would be, again, uh, in my mind, uh, it's, it's understanding you don't know how good it is. You don't know how, how wonderful it is. And so God becoming holy or hallowed in your hearts is you just becoming more under the, uh, more aware of how good and holy God is. Uh, I, I went to... Uh, so when I was uh, in high school, uh, I went to this thing called Boy State. And now Boy State, uh, what it is, is, is that it's, it's run by the American Legion all across. Every state in America does it. And it's the summer before, uh, I think it's the summer before your, your junior year, maybe. And you go, and, and they're all state. It's not, it's not partisan at all. I mean, it's, it's, it's not Democrat or Republican. Just you go there, and you learn about how America works from, from, from a Democratic standpoint. And it was designed, and they bring in every politician that will come. Anyone who's elected can come, and they speak about how great the system is. And the idea of Boy State was to help you understand how, how great things work in America by comparison. Why that is is that when it was created was during the time when Nazism and fascism was on the rise, and they wanted to create their, and so people were getting really interested, and part of the, the mantra of fascism, and especially in America, was like, hey, America was good for a time, but we need something new and different, and so they were worried about people getting caught up in fascism, so they started Boy State and Girl State, they also have Girl State, to, to get you excited and compare and say, no, by comparison, what we have is far greater than you may imagine. That was the point of it. So you would see, by contrast, what you have is really, really, really great. And in one sense, being God being hallowed is that, again, because people can chase after any master, any God they want, but by comparison, the hope would be that you realize when you compare the gospel, when you compare Christ to these other things, he comes across even better and greater. You need to make him hallowed and holy in your heart. And why I think when Peter is saying you need to make God holy in your heart, you set aside of heart, why I think this is really about master is that this is what Jesus, this is what Paul, this is what they talk about. What God being, again, this might sound very simple, let's make God holy. And I want to argue that the, the reason why we need to, to be disciples, we need to be meeting with people who are, 
who are digging into us really hard. And again, the premise of this whole series is that we want you as a church um, to go through this, this whole series and be like, you know what, I need to have uh, some close people in my life who are challenging me, who are, who are digging into me. And if I don't have that, I want, we we're hoping you see that, that everyone needs it. Whatever your age is, whatever your circumstances, you should have that. As we want the assumption to be when you come here, this is what you're, you're going to get, right? And why I think this premise is about changing leaders is that, that the idea of God being holy is not a clean, easy process. It is, it is a struggle. Is it a battle? Why? It's because our hearts are looking for a master. And being a disciple is, in essence, you saying, you know what? I'm willing to trade one master who's going to lead me to hell to another one who's going to take me to eternity in heaven. It's harsh language, but that's what it's saying. So let's look. So first, Jesus tells us, right? Your heart can't have two masters. Your heart wants, your heart longs to have any master except God right? Your heart will take three or four or five. And Jesus is saying, you can't even handle two. You're going to love one and hate the other. You're going to obey one and despise the other. Here he's even talking about how money can be like this. But again, that we're being taught that your heart is looking and, and, and is, is ready and looking for a master. Your heart wants to be enslaved to something. And so God, the gospel message, listen, your heart's going to be enslaved somewhere. Who do you want in charge of it? Some people are like, I don't want my heart enslaved to anybody. That's just not how the heart works. Here's another passage where Jesus says, again, the, the root of all of this comes down to sin. Everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. You see that there, we see in Scripture when we're talking about your hearts and when setting aside of them holy, the, the, the terminology that comes up is, is slave and master language. That you're going to be a slave to something, and because of sin, you're a slave to sin. And Jesus says, you're a slave to sin. It can't be that way. You can't have two. You cannot have God and be a slave to sin. Something has to give. Paul talks about it. Paul talks about, listen, it, it, you're a slave to whatever it is you're serving, right? If it's to sin, it's death. But if it's to, to Christ, it's to righteousness. So that's when I talk, think about when Peter's talking about the, this passage here, what, what it means to be a disciple it sounds great. Just set apart your heart as holy to the Lord. No, what's really happening underneath that is saying, listen, you're going to have to trade one master for another. And your heart is squirrely. What are you going to do? And Peter paints a great picture here. Because um, the, the, it's interesting because he kind of breaks it apart. Um, and because and he has one thought, but he adds this one part in the middle about um, being ready to speak. And we're going to talk about that in a second. But really his thought is this, set your, set your hearts apart as holy to the Lord. And, and, and then the result of that is going to be hope. Again, we're talking about witness, living out the gospel. And Peter's thought is, listen, as a disciple, I want you to live out the gospel in such a way that your heart, the, the, the point of it, what you want to see happen, if you're looking for people who are going to disciple you, like, I want to be a disciple, what does that mean? It means they're going to be working with you to see your heart unchained and chained to Christ. Their job is like, how, how are you acting like a slave to the Lord? You're like, I don't like that language. That's the language. Like, how are you, how is Christ your master? Right? And, and what's one, wonderful here is that the fruit of that, ready? The fruit of, of him being your master, Peter is pointing out is this word hope. The byproduct of your heart being enslaved to Christ is hope. This is so powerful because we're living in a hopeless world. Anything, anything, any ideology, any political thoughts, anything apart from the gospel is hopelessness. And so here's Peter saying, listen, set your parts, hearts apart as holy to the Lord. And what's going to happen as a result of that, this witness in how you're living, again, so you're living, you're, you're living as Christ as your master. And at the same time, what's going to happen is hope is going to spill out. Hope in a hopeless situation, hope in a hopeless world stands out. As a disciple, you need to be prepared for the fact when he's talking about let your light shine, this is, what this is what he's talking about. Again, the God's holiness, you can't really contain it, but your hope is not containable. Your hope is just going to spill out. This is your witness. Paul's going to talk in a second about 
what you do about that hope, but he's just letting you know, a disciple is someone, again, whose, whose heart is now chained to Christ and learning what that means, but what happens as a result of that is hope. This is God's natural plan for how evangelism works, right? Hope is just going to spill out, and hope permeates everything. I know many of you, we live in D.C., many of you have jobs that you are, you have to sign a contract saying you understand that you don't talk about religion. You don't, it's, in, it's totally inappropriate. You can be fired for bringing up inappropriate things other than the workplace. Government jobs have very high, tight regulations, I know. But hope, hope squeaks out wherever you're at. You are going to have a hope that the world doesn't understand. It's going to come out. It just is. This is part of the discipleship process. You want someone talking about where, you know, do you have hope in this life? Where is your hope? You're following Christ. I see no hope. Something's wrong here, right? This is what you want to have someone working in your hearts, but it says hope is just going to come out. And again, we get to what you say in a second. We're talking about the first part, witness, that you set apart Christ as holy. And he says, at the same time, hope is going to spill out. Hope spills out in just you being you, which is wonderful for living in a place like D.C. where we have all these rules about what you can and can't see at the workplace. There is no rule against hope. No hope here, right? That doesn't work. You're going to have hope in a hopeless world, and that's going to demand a response. People are going to want to know why you have a hope. They're going to want to know why you're living the way you're living. What's going on? Now we get, that leads us to evangelism. So again, Paul talks about discipleship. It's like this thing where your heart is set apart, and you have this hope, and you're going to share. And again, I think this is about your heart learning to have a new master, you were enslaved to sin, now you're enslaved to Christ. And what comes with being enslaved to Christ now is not only salvation of your souls, but hope, a new life. Things are changing, right? You're being transformed. Hope is now coming out. And so look at this next verse, the second part of 315. It says, always been prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that is in you. Again, the idea that this holiness and hope go hand in hand, right? You're, you're living out your faith. Holiness and hope just come out. And he says, now you need to be ready to share. That's what evangelism is. Evangelism is sharing the good news. Witness is living the good news. Evangelism is sharing the good news. You need to be direct and intentional. That's what evangelism is. You're actually sharing the reason that you have. Uh, King David uh, wrote a psalm about this, uh, about sharing his, sharing his faith, what it means to evangelize, actually share the good news. This is from Psalm 40, verses 9 through 10. And to sum it up for you, what he says is, what it means to evangelize is to this. To not, res not, sorry, not restrain, don't hide, and don't conceal. Evangelism, you're not constraining your lips, you're not hiding, you're not concealing it. Remember, Peter's vision is that your heart is so transformed by God's holiness that the result is you now have hope in a hopeless situation. You have hope in a world that's dying and decaying. You have hope when horrible things are happening all around us. You have a hope. And people will say, what is this hope? And Peter's saying again, you need, you, as a disciple, you need to be ready to answer to anyone and everyone who asks, why do you have a hope? And your answer needs to point them. Again, witness doesn't point to Christ. Witness just lets them aware something's going on with you. And then when they ask what's wrong with you, your answer is to tell them and point them to Jesus Christ. And this part is hard culturally where we're living in now. Uh, Mark Twain said, he's a par actually paraphrasing a parable, but Mark Twain famously said, you know, it's better to remain quiet and let people think you're a fool than to actually open your mouth and let them all know that you are, right? Well, when it comes to evangelism as a disciple, we need to be disciple of the fact we need to be prepared for the fact that people are probably going to think we're fools. As a matter of fact, Scripture teaches that unless the Holy Spirit is working in their hearts, they will only think of you as a fool. They're going to see your hope, and you're going to point them to the reason for your hope. And unless the Holy Spirit is working in their heart, their response is going to be, you're a fool. 
And this is where we get to the last part of this passage, verse 16 and 17. But before I get there, just remember, this is what Christ wants to have happen. When they ask you, why do you have a hope? Your answer is to point them to Christ. I've lived and experienced that. Uh, when we were living in London, we were there to share with the people who were, who were quickly rejecting God in all levels, rejecting Christ on all levels. We had people we knew for months and months. We would talk to them. They finally like, yeah, hey, tell, us, tell us about you guys. You guys seem really nice, right? There's, there is some hope in you guys. Like why, you know, London's a hopeless place. Why do you have hope? What's going on? Well, we know Jesus. We're here to plant churches. And you would see them look at you be like, oh man, I just thought you were okay. Now you're a weirdo, right? I don't want to, I, I don't have any milk to offer you today, right? Like you have any, you know, we borrowed, wouldn't borrowed, you know, we had neighbors that we would borrow stuff from all the time we were cooking because nothing around us was open that late. And after we told them we were Christians, they were like, we're all out <laughs> whenever we needed help or anything. They looked at us like we were fools. You need prepared for how they respond. And unless God is working in their hearts, their only response is to look at you like you're foolish. But again, what is Peter saying here? Peter's saying, listen, the disciple is someone who's going through a power change in your heart. Are you resisting the power change or are you embracing it? As a disciple, you have to learn to embrace it, work with it. Your job, that's why we need people speaking to our hearts. Help us see, are we embracing this power change in our hearts? Is it a peaceful transition or a painful transition? How is the transition going in your heart? And Peter's saying, as that transition happens, lo and behold, hope is going to start seeping into your life. That hope is going to stand out, and they're going to want to know why you have a hope. And he's saying, listen, this is why we need people speaking our We need to prepare to give an answer. Now, verses, last part of verse 15 and 16 and 17, this is so important. It goes on with the whole full thing I'm talking about. Peter's saying, listen, you're going to give an answer. You're going to have a hope, and people aren't going to like what you're having to say. They're going to be hostile. Actually, Jesus says, let, they're going to be mad at you. Let them be mad at you for your good deeds. Peter's saying the same thing. If they're going to be mad at you, let them be mad at you that you have hope in a hopeless world. He says, do with gentleness and respect. And he talks, talks about some other stuff. Why, why they should better mad at you? What he's saying is this. Listen, if they're going to be mad at you, if they're going to think you're foolish, if they're going to think you're crazy, let it not be because of you. Let it be because of the gospel. The gospel can handle them thinking it's crazy. If they're going to be incensed and angry, let it be at the words of the Bible, not at you. The Bible can withstand any argument against it. If they're going to be mad and think you're crazy, let it be at the hope you have, but not at you. Peter's saying, listen, your job, your job is to become like Christ, is to embrace this power change. And what's going to happen, hope is just going to come as a result of it. And be prepared when people ask you about this hope. And when they do ask you about this hope, when they want to know why are you, why are you the way you are, this is Peter saying, Jesus says the same thing. Your job is just to as clearly as possible point them in the right direction. You don't want them to think about you. You want them to think about the gospel. Peter's saying, listen, your job is to point and get out of the way. Don't let them be upset at you. Let them be upset at the message. The message can handle it. This is what Peter's telling us. This is what discipleship looks like to Peter. Your heart is going through a power change, a transition of power. That's what it means to be a disciple. You're giving authority over to Christ. And that's going to look different and be painful for all of us. This is why we need people in our lives to help this happen. And then you need to be prepared now. Again, we even need more help because now that you're, as things are changing, hope comes out. Guys, remember, hope can come out in any place you are. In any situation, you can be working in jobs that have the strictest don't talk about stuff policy ever. Your hope still comes out. 
And Peter's saying again to his disciple, be trained, be ready. So when that opportunity comes and they do ask, you're doing a good job of pointing. A disciple is just someone who does a good job at pointing them to the reason for the hope. A bad disciple is someone who points to themselves, tries to take their credit. A disciple you want to be is someone who's just doing a good job pointing to the gospel of Jesus Christ, pointing them to the reason for your hope. Paul's vision of disciples are people who understand what it means to be dedicated to the whole process. I think Peter's talking about, listen, you need to understand that it's about your heart, your heart struggling with this transition of power. Whoever else has authority of your heart, it leads nowhere. But as Christ, as Christ leads your heart, as he is the master of your heart, something new and wonderful comes. Not just eternity, but hope. Peter sees his discipleship as trading one master for another. So you have to ask yourselves this morning, who is your master? Is it Christ or is it anyone else? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for sending your son. Lord, our hearts not only enslaved by sin, but we've been tainted by it. And so, Lord, we need our hearts to be transformed. It's not just a one-time thing, Lord. We aren't just attached to you. We need our hearts and lives to be transformed. So we pray, Lord, that we would understand what it means to have you as our master. And Lord, help us to prepare for all the hope that comes from it. Jesus, in your name we pray. Amen. Please stand for our final song.